Welcome to the official tennis.com podcast featuring professional coach and community leader, Kamal Murray. Welcome to the tennis.com podcast. I'm your host, Kamal Murray, and we are here with the man, the myth, used to be a legend. Now he is current. He is out front. Will Smith has not only immortalized uh, Richard Williams, but also has, to those who were not aware of who Rick Macy was and his character, they've also immortalized you, Rick. So welcome to the show. <laughs> Thanks for joining. No, I'm glad to be here. It'll be a lot of fun. Now, I remember I met you when I was 11 or 12. We were at a camp. At the time, Reebok had a big push to get a lot of African-American players in the game. And it was myself, Shanae Perry, Eric Graves, Eric Jackson, and Venus and Serena at that time, I think we were Reebok. They were all there at the Embraerie yeah. in Fort Lauderdale. There you go. Back in the day. <laughs> yeah, no, that was uh, one of the stops early on, you know, after Del Rey. And uh, I, since you brought it up, I remember it like it was yesterday. That was like a good time. Yeah. yeah. And you were actually the first white coach I was on the court with. <laughs> And you had so much energy. I was like, this dude's like, you know, in my mind, I'm thinking this dude's energetic. He's old. He's got some soul. It's literally like 35 black kids on the court and one white dude and a couple of <laughs> college students. And you were out there running the show like it never mattered. Yeah. You know, you know, I think, well, first off, I've kind of been that way ever since I was a kid, you know, with any sport that I played. But regarding tennis, if, if you love it and you have the passion, and you care about others more than you care about yourself. Um, you just do what you got to do. And, you know, and so I've always kind of been that way. And that's been a big staple to help extract greatness out of others. Because if you can inspire others, then you're really changing more than a tennis game. You could change some people's lives. Yeah. Now, you're a Midwest boy. Um, yeah. You're from Ohio and I'm from Chicago. Okay. And, I, we're, and I we're in the neighborhood. We're in the neighborhood. same neighborhood. Yeah. Um, and I always like sort of am fighting this good fight because people always say in order to make it in tennis, you got to be in Florida, California, Texas, whatever. And I'm always raising the hand like, hey, you know, Donald Young's from Chicago. Taylor Townsend's from Chicago. Nick Boletieri's from the Midwest, coached in Chicago. Rick Macy's from Ohio. Jack Sox from, right, Andy Roddick's yeah. from Nebraska. I'm like, there's plenty of cold weather states that produce good tennis players. Yeah. You know, listen, at the end of the day, people say that because you can play all year round in Florida or, you know, California, a little bit in Texas. So I can see, and they kind of gravitate there because especially Florida, because that's where all the tournaments are. And so if people then just say, Hey, I'm not getting out of New York. I'm not getting that Vermont. I might not be getting that Chicago and you want that competition. So I think it's changed more over the year, but listen, if you're good, and you know how to compete, you know, you can, you can be from North Korea. It doesn't matter to me, you know, I mean, that might be a little far-fetched, but I'm just <laughs> saying it's, it's, you know, athletes are everywhere, you know, so it's not one size fits all. And so um, whether you're a coach or a player, uh, you can come from anywhere you want. And when you think about some of the greatest names in the game, like yourself, Nick Boletieri, you went to Wright State, right? Like a lot of people always say, oh, you know, these, you know, you think about Phil Jackson, right? And, you know, the, the success he had not being a former Michael Jordan, right? And yeah. just the, the intellect part of the game that doesn't have to come from being number one in the world as an actual player. How did you end up going to right state and sort of your ascent into coaching? Yeah, you know, first off, it's a great question. And so I got to kind of take a step back and let me just kind of uh, tell you, tell you the story. You know, I, I picked, I was, I played all sports when I was little, you know, football, baseball, basketball, hockey. I used to win pump passing kick all the time. And I was very good in basketball. I'm in the hall of fame in my high school. And uh, it's probably better in basketball than tennis. I picked up a racket. I was a four handicap in golf when I was like 11, four. And I, I'm, I was better at 11 than I am now. You know, I don't play anymore, <laughs> but I don't know what, what happened to that. So and, you know, my dad, my dad died when I was like 10 years old. And so I was just my mom and me and my sister. And so we lived in a park and I lived about a half mile from the tennis courts. And I just went down there one day. I picked up a racket, started hitting against the wall. And I just loved the sound. And every time I hit it against the wall, it came back. And I kind of liked that, you know. So from that day, 12 years old, fast forward by the time I was 18, I was number one in the Ohio Valley. I never had a lesson. 
Okay, I beat guys that went to Ohio State everywhere. Uh, I actually dabbled a little bit on the satellite because I was very, I think, mentally strong and you know a decent athlete. And um, so that's kind of my story. But I would just practice eight, 10 hours a day. I'd, I'd hit on the wall after basketball practice when the janitor was in there. My mom would drive me back and I'd shovel the snow and hit against the wall because I couldn't afford to play indoors in Dayton, Ohio, which was like 20 miles away. So that's kind of how I grew up. A uh, half mile from the park, and I'll continue the story. But while it's in my mind, I live a half mile from the park, as you know. It's named Rick Macy Tennis Center, so my whole career has come full circle um, as far as that goes. But when you're going down that that road, I knew early on, unless you're going to be great, uh, you're not going to make any money. So early on, when I started teaching, uh, I like to help others more than I like to help myself, and I had a gift to communicate, and I love to analyze things. Uh, it was funny because I'd go to the movie as a kid and I'd go with all my friends and like five minutes in, I'd be telling them how the movie's going to end and they would all leave because they didn't want to be around me. I'm telling them how it's all going to end. Right. I had this thing and I always, and that's why I think I was a good point guard in basketball. You know, I passed the ball and hit guys in the chest and I just always looked at things different. And so I got into this tennis and I just love being on the court and just love helping others. And as you know, as you go down the yellow brick road, you, you get the education and you know, it's not about all the great players I've coached or what I've done. That's the window dressing. I just tell people who's ever on the other side of the net, that hour, that minute, that second, that's my favorite student. And I still teach 50 hours a week uh, privately now. I teach seven days. I love it just as much. So when you have that energy and passion and you love it, it can radiate onto others when they're not having the best day or they don't want to run. Uh, you know, I got to, I not only motivate the kids, I motivate the parents. I train the parents as much as the kids, as you know, that's a, that in itself, you know, and I'm bulletproof after Richard for four years, you know, I should, <laughs> I should be, I should be in the hall of fame just for that. But no, he's like my best friend. I love the guy and the girls are like my daughters, but that's how it all started. And then as you, as you keep going and going, you just, uh, uh, you acquire the knowledge. And I, that's my message. Any coach that hears us speaking, because uh, you got to get better every day and you got to learn every day from your students. And I've always been ahead of the curve with biomechanics and just the way I kind of do things. So uh, I think the most and the best thing I like, I'm the exact same guy from Greenville, Ohio with those values. And, you know, I think that's a big part of how I can connect with people and extract great. So it's funny, you said a couple of things. So always I was, I'm on the court just like you now. And everyone always says what? Well, you know, who's your favorite student? And I say, well, what day of the week and what time is it? There you go. There Wednesday you go. at three o'clock, this person is my favorite student. And Friday at five o'clock, this person is my favorite. During the time that I'm with you, you got to make them feel. And the other thing you said, when I was on the court with you when I was a kid, we were doing live ball drills, point simulation. And one of the things I remember, you would stop the point in the middle of the point. And the kids were like, oh my God, I was going to win that point. You're like, no, you weren't, right? You talk about seeing things sort of before everybody else. Right. Yeah. Uh, in terms of seeing where it's going. To, my wife hates it because she'll be in the middle of a statement. And I was like, and I'll, I'll interrupt her. She said, I didn't finish. I said, I already know what you're going to say. Right. Just in terms of that gift, the analytics to sort of see. And same thing with the point, you know, and I started coaching, yeah. you know, I was I was an OK player. Right. But I always felt like my gift was the analytics and just sort of seeing the evolution of this point and being able to really give that yeah. to a player that was already talented. No, Where did you learn yeah. that? No, you know, it's like people, you know, before, before, where the ball lands, I don't even have to look to see if it's going in or out. I've been out here since age 22, you know, I'm now 67. <laughs> I mean, I know if it's going in and out, I don't even have to look, you know, right. I know where the ball's going, you know, before they even hit it, just by the speed of the ball, the height of the ball, where it lands, where the approach is, it's going to be a lob. Like, you know, you learn anticipation, but when you say, to, when you say the same thing over and over again, you, you, got, you get better at anticipating, you know, and I've sung this song for so much. So when you can think ahead, you're getting ahead. And so understanding the geometry of the court, I just think, because I've probably, in my opinion, I've probably been on the court teaching more than anybody, okay, day in and day out uh, the last 40 years than anybody, you know, probably, for sure, probably in this country, if not the world. You got to, I'm, I'm still on the court doing the exact same thing to anybody, anytime, anywhere. So when you're there that much, it's like your living room. You just, you just know it. It's, it's hard. 
to explain. You as a coach has a better idea what I'm saying. It's just hard to explain. And then I have the ability to articulate it different than a guy with a PhD. You know, I can articulate it in a way where it's down and they, they just understand it and I can explain it. If they don't, I go through another door or I'll go through the window or I'll right. try the chimney. I don't know how I'll get there and I won't let go like a pit bull until I, until I can connect the dots. And I think the ability to communicate besides motivate is just one piece of the puzzle that kind of has helped me along the way. Yeah, you know, one of the things you said was you grew up half mile from the tennis courts, right? And I've always said that in this country, the biggest hurdle, aside from the financial part, right, is just proximity, right? When I'm on tour and I'm sitting at the bar talking to players, whether it be Kvitova or whatever, most of their, or even Sloan, right? Most of their story starts with, I grew up across the street from a tennis court. Yeah. It doesn't start with, I was in a gym and this guy saw me throw a ball and he came and say, you know, it was not that. It's always just about proximity, right? Yeah. What do you feel the biggest sort of hindrance aside from the financial piece is to American tennis right now? Yeah, well, obviously you already talked about the financial part, just it's easier to grab a ball and shoot a jump shot or run out and tackle your neighbor. You know what I mean? <laughs> so it's like, you know, for better or for worse on that. Right. So, and you know, so, the biggest hindrance is, and someone asked me that, you know, a couple of days ago, and, and the USTA doesn't like my answer on this, you know, they don't want to find a needle in the haystack, you know, but, but I did, and I, I took the chance with Venus and Serena. It's not just the sweat equity, but the financial part. Now people are probably stunned about what I did, you know, how I went all in, but we don't get the best athletes at six, seven, eight, nine. I would, I would get people that have played in the Olympics, people that played high level college, whether it be NFL, NBA, hockey, I would get the boys, the girls a little easier because the physicality is not as much. Yeah. And, you know, you can test this like they do at the Olympics. You can draw blood. You can fat, find out about fast twitch muscle, but they'd rather go with the masses. I'm not saying it's wrong. And now it's like, oh, we got all these people in the top hundred. Duh, we should. We got a big country, you right. know? So my point is if I would have had LeBron James, and this is nothing about Rick Macy. It's just, I know what I can do at 10 years old. He'd be number one in the world. There's no doubt about it. There's Easily. no doubt, you know, not even me because you you hit the road already running with things that are baked in extra crispy with the DNA. So that's what I would do. But a lot of these kids that they, they go to other sports and the sport is so global. And that's why we're behind with the men. Uh, they, you could get Francis or Riley, my good friend. They might grab a slam once the three other guys get out of there. But right. to be there, as you know, and stay there, that's rare air. You know, to be great, that's a special fraternity. To be good, you can always have a good tournament or, or you might grab a slam and be a – that's nothing to sneeze about. I'm not downplaying it. But at the end of the day, if you have more bases covered or more boxes checked, okay, and Corda might be something in that area. He could. You have a better chance. But we don't get those kids – you know, those 50 kids and we fund them and we go all in and we hedge our bet and put the money there. And listen, the worst thing about it, you change their life. You make it easier on the parents. They get to go to college for free, whatever the deal might come out because you're not going to hit on all of them. But you would have maybe three or four LeBrons or three or four Jordans that are on the tour. And you know, as well as I do, when you're nervous, if you can run and compete, you can still win matches, 100%. But, but, but if you see the people now that are there, I mean, think about it. Riley's seven feet, Isner's six eleven. They should be shooting jump shots and layups. Right. And they're the two better Americans. Now I don't mean, listen, all the guys are great, but it's just rare air when you get guys that can move and you have this athleticism, like better Djokovic, Murray, these guys, um, it, it's a, it's a different animal like the Dow that you're, you're getting into tennis from uh, now we might get a couple just by it happens to happen, but hedge your bet, go for the needles in the haystack. That's what I would do. Get them at an early age, get the optimal forehand, like Federer or whoever, get the optimal backhand like Joker, you know, get the biomechanics of the serve like Roddick or this guy. And, but then again, it's all in the eye of the holder. You might see something different than, than I see. So who's, evaluating the talent you know a good friend of mine you know who, who was a scout for the hope he's not watching it's a scout for the Cleveland Cavaliers 
he would tell me, he, could, he just kept telling me that Dwayne Wade was not that good coming out of college. All he did is shoot layups and run. And I said, his game's made for the pros. Yeah. He can improvise. It's more wide open, you know? So, and he's a big time scout in pro basketball. So at the end of the day, it's what, you know, I would love to be able to help the USTA because what they may see is different than Rick may see. So it's a little different. It's a little yeah. different. You know what I mean? So that's, that would be the biggest, that's the biggest hindrance. It's more global. There's more fish in the pond, but listen, we're not getting the, the optimal athlete that's checking more of those boxes, great family, competitive environment, you know, um, and then we optimize it at a young age. And I'm not saying cloning, I'm not saying we clone people, but you want to put Humpty Dumpty together the best you can. You know, it's funny. So I got, was on a, I was on a panel with, you know, Paul Anacone and some other dude that was doing a study with USDA talking about what we could do to change. And that's exactly what I said. I said, number one, you got to decentralize it, right? Where you have the, the sections who know players that are decent, right? Mm -hmm. And then you bring together guys who know what they're talking about with different set of eyes. Like my eye might go, I mean, my eye sounds like yours, right? Yeah. My vision of how you win, you this and uh, this will and always will be a game about errors to me, number one. Mm -hmm. And number two, when you are so tight that you can't even breathe, if you can run, you can win, right? Yeah, and so yeah. to, to take those 50 kids, put them in a situation where you have you, Nick, myself, Paul, whatever, and let us sit in a room and go back and forth about what we like and don't like about the athlete, or maybe not like, or, or what the challenges are on the athlete to come up with the best plan to create a champion with yeah. guys who have done it or knows what it looks like in the past and those are the current. And I think that is so doable. You're so accessible. Nick is so accessible. I'm accessible. Get 50 kids. Let us all go down there and pick five yeah. that you can mold. Yeah. Well, first off, I totally agree with the concept, but here's the thing about that. This all started in 1988. I mean, I went to Chicago with Landstore. I mean, I, everybody went there. They, We've tried doing this. We met at Key Biscayne in Miami and had, you know, this smorgasbord of people who have had some success in coaching and, but nothing ever percolates because whether it's about control or power or whatever, because people, you know, they have their own job or who knows what the reasons are. And, but this can be done, but it doesn't seem like uh, it's the most important thing, you know, and to say, well, it happens with the women. It's a little different. Not a lot of women are playing football, okay? And a lot of them, you know, it's a tennis can be very lucrative, you know, if you have some athletic, the physicality isn't quite that there. So I think we'll always have champions and Grand Slam uh, winners on the women's side, just because there's more in the pool and we're getting a better athlete on the women's side. But with the men, I agree with you. I, that would be great. And, uh, but this has been talked about many, many times for really the last 40 years. And we've had a few summits. We had one at the US Open. We had one in Chicago, a Key Biscayne. I can remember going to these things and nothing really ever bubbled up from that. And I, what's funny is because you you got your own thing, I got my own thing. I don't think what I'm saying is either one of us has to have control. It's just, here are our ideas. Here are the blind spots. Even if it's USTA, here's what you should lock in on, right? Here's what you should begin to address. And that could easily be done. So let me ask you this. How true was the story? You know, I, I honestly, I watched the movie King Richard and I, I cried almost the whole time because a lot of the adversity and the things that were said to Richard and the challenges he faced, I faced and still face. Uh, and even the, even the fart at the table, I was like, that, that's so Richard. So that's how Richard. true, how <laughs> true was the story? Okay. Well, it was like amazingly true. Okay. And I'll, I'll start going down, you know, the road here. Um, before I went to Compton, a lot of things that you saw in the movie, Richard did tell me about that back in 91. Okay. He told me about a lot of that stuff. Now, whether it happened just like that gun and all this stuff, uh, he told me about the tape to Vic Braden. Uh, I really didn't know anything about Cohen. I never heard of that him before, but I, all that happened prior to me because I went out there in 91 when Richard called me. So everything before that, he did tell me a lot of that. So whether that's true or not, I'm the wrong guy to ask. Once I, once I talked to Richard, he called me up and uh, 
he just, we started talking and I didn't know anything about Compton, you know, other than there was riots and stuff like that. He goes, Rick, Rick, I, I promise I won't get you shot. You know, I remember I actually talked to Richard. I went up to West Palm two weeks ago and we just, it was like going down, back down memory lane. He was crying. We were laughing stories. The guy's doing amazing. Okay. We'll talk about that later. So I, I just, the guy was so funny, you know, and by then, uh, Caparati was gone. She was like top 10 in the world already. So I just said, I got to go. I got to go see what this is all about. And I never gone on a plane. I never went anywhere to see someone. I either saw them at the Easter Bowl, the Orange Bowl, national tournaments, or they came to the Academy. I never got on a plane and went to see, let alone a nine and 10 year old. But she was in the, she was in the New York Times. She won a lot of matches in 10 and under. And uh, someone from Advantage International, which is now Octagon, said, you should take a look. So when I talked to Richard, he was real funny. So I flew out there. I went there. And they met me at the hotel at 7 o'clock. <laughs> I, I told Venus Serena this at the after party. They were just like, break up left. Venus was on one leg. Serena on the other. The arms around Richard. They're hugging. They're kissing. And Venus and Serena are just staring at me. You know, I think, I think they just had acquaintances. They didn't have a lot of friends. They were just like staring at me. And Richard, it was, I was like in a deposition. He asked me like 50 questions. This guy was grilling me. I'm going, but I respected it because I was, he was thinking, well, if I'm going to let some dude come into the circle and coach my kids, I want to know a lot about him. So we talked for like two and a half hours. And then the next day he goes, uh, we're going to pick you up at seven o'clock and we're going to go to East Compton Hills Country Club. I said, all right. So they picked me up at seven and that bus you see in the movie, identical, the Prince thing on the front wobbly red and white i get in the front seat i sit in the passenger side i get harpooned in the butt off okay there's a spring sticking up i look in the back there's serena and venus i call her meek and bw they're in there like that there's four months worth of mcdonald's wrapper there's old clothes it smells there's ball hoppers there's balls in there it looked like afghanistan back there i'm going this is crazy so we start driving about 10 miles 10 minutes i'm looking around i'm going this is a crazy place for a country club. So we pull up to a park, okay? And there's like 20 guys playing basketball. People are passed out on the grass. People are drinking, smoking. I'm going, this is crazy stuff. You know, I was, remember, I was at a five-star resort. I was a director of tennis at Greenleaf Golf and Tennis Resort in Haines City. So I'm just going, and now I went to the other, I went to the other side of the rainbow. <laughs> so we get out and we cross the basketball court and it parted like the Red Sea. And people write down, hey, Richard, hey, King Richard. I'm going, what are they calling this guy King for? This was 91. They called this guy. How ironic is this? They called it King Richard. Then they go, hey, Meek, because Serena's middle name was Serena Jamika Williams. Then they go, hey, VW. So they like knew these like little kids and the dad. We go across the basketball court. We go onto the tennis court. And I had a brand new box of Wilson balls shipped there. And he goes, uh, Rick, we don't use new balls. I want old balls. I want them digging and bending them out. I'm going, okay, I get it. But it was a little, it was a little different, you know? So we get on the court, Richard had a basket um, and there was like seven chains wrapped around the basket. It took the guy like 20 minutes to get the chains off. He goes, Rick, I got to secure it. It'd be gone in the morning. I'm going, this is insanity. The court, me and you would never play on it. You wouldn't play on it. There's grass. It was like, it's like <laughs> terrible. So we finally start hitting. I'm doing drills with the girls and I'm going, what in God's name am I doing in Compton, California on a Saturday? Now, remember, I had Jennifer and she probably was the greatest junior player of all time to win the 12 national goal of 18 as a 12 year old. And that was 1988. And that still stands today. Mm -hmm. She had her racket back in the parking lot. Her knees were bent. Her center of gravity. The ball was on a string from the late Jake the late, great Jimmy Everett. He taught her great fundamentals, Chris's dad. So my reference point was pretty much different than anybody, especially with a female, than anybody in the world. So I'm out there with these two girls. I mean, Serena was like all over the place. And Venus, there was arms and legs and tentacles going this way. And beads were flying off. And I'm going, this is crazy. It was improvised city. You know what I mean? It was a jailbreak. And I'm just going, this is crazy. So we're volleying and they're just like Tommy Hawk. It was crazy stuff. So I said, after an hour, I I'm, I'm, couldn't wait till the day ended. I'm thinking there may be 60, 70 in the country. Not any better, not any worse. They had some speed, but. So I said, let's play some competitive points. 
So I took Serena with me because she was littler. She was nine. Venus was almost 5'10", very tall, thin, arms and legs. And Richard goes, are you ready for this? I go, I, I'm always ready. I don't have to get ready. He goes, I like that. I like that. So we started playing me and Serena against Venus. And right then and there, after five minutes, it blew me away. The footwork changed dramatically. They were popping the popcorn, extra butter. Okay. Just like in the movie, the preparation got a little cleaner. Okay. It wasn't filet mignon, but it wasn't like hamburger anymore. It got a little <laughs> better, but the burning desire to get to the ball, both these two little girls would try so hard to get to the ball. They almost fell down. And this was on any type of tough shot. I'm going, I, I never saw anything like this in my life. I didn't even see other boys. It was, I, it was just like a rage. And I'm going, whoa. Then I'm thinking six feet, 160, 5'10", 145. I'm projecting where this could go in my mind as I got older. But when they competed, it was brutal. It was just like they went for the jugular. I came with Richard. I go, Richard, come here. Because it was more about Venus at this age. I said, let me tell you something. You got the next female Michael Jordan on your hand. And he puts his arm around me and he goes, no brother, man, I got the next two. And that's in the movie also. And that's true. And then Venus said, daddy, can I go to the bathroom, the restroom? So they're hugging and kissing close knit family, just like you see in the movie. I mean, it was bang. It was mm -hmm. like bangs in the movie too. So it was like that. So Venus walks out the gate for five feet on her hands. And then five feet, she does these backward court cartwheels. And I go to Richard, I said, I forget, I think both these kids can be number one someday. They're going to transcend the sport because all these girls, it was the 90s, early 90s. If they were big and strong, they weren't nimble. You know, now you got, you know, Sloan can run, everybody can run. So, but it was different back then because you weren't, you didn't have the package. And I saw another layer and they went for the jugular. And I just said, if they wanted me to coach them because they haven't decided on anything, I know what I could do. I knew what I could do. But I, and it was going to be a big project because like I said, arms and legs and hair going everywhere. This wasn't Capriotti where it was already, a lot of things were there. To deal with athletes and coach athletes is sometimes more difficult because they have more options and they improvise. And, you know, I had to be careful even about the way I was, I wanted to coach them right then and there about what to do. Uh, the volleys and stuff were easy, but the ground strokes and all this other stuff. So at the end of the day, spent the whole weekend together. Um, then they decided, uh, in that following September, uh, we want to, you know, be with Rick. So yeah, everything in the movie, uh, almost everything is so spot on the things that were said, the moment, the time, the clothes, how the girls mimic the girls strokes. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's a few things that maybe aren't exactly right, but at the end of the day, the thing that I like the most, and then I'll let you chime in is I think the whole tennis world now knows what Rick Macy really did and how much I really cared about the girls because something happened in that three and a half years. Think about this. No matches, no tournaments, three and a half years, hibernating at Rick Macy Academy, four or five hours a day with me, with me and hitting partners and stuff like that. Taekwondo, boxing, ballet, <laughs> everything. And I get her that wild card in the Bank of West Classic because she had to play that because the WTA changed the age eligibility rule in 1994 because of Capriotti. So they pretty much put a gun to our head. And I go, Richard, someone's going to dictate to you or do you want to turn her pro? If they wouldn't have changed the rule, she might have <laughs> she might have still not be played. I don't know. So we kind of had to make a decision. And Richard said, we're playing. So think about it. No competition. You walk off the street. You beat 57 in the world. You almost beat number one. I mean, you can't make this stuff up. But during that time frame, I think people now know, not that's just the financial part that was put into this, but just what happened during that time frame. And more importantly, the influence when you're with someone, like you've been with a player for a long time now and then. So every day, four or five hours, six hours a day, four years, take that times 365. And then you're dealing with Richard. He was stubborn and out of control. But I love the guy because of how he treated the girls and how he interacted with his children. He was a world-class father. And so it was about me helping the girls. 
and I could deal with Richard. That's obviously I coach the kids as much as the parents. So that was a great question. So let me ask you this then. You've had the chance to deal with some, I mean, legendary parents, right? Andy Roddick, Sharapova's people. We talk about, um, you know, Capriati's parents. Tell me how you deal with that, right? Because, you know, from my vantage point, it takes a strong force, yeah. right? To create a world-class tennis player, even before they find you or find Nick or find me, the parent has to do so much work and has to be the battery in the back to push them. Because if you give kids options, too many options as a kid, they'll choose to do nothing, right? Yeah. So it yeah. does take a strong parent, yeah. right? Yeah. So how did you deal with the differences in some of these parents? Because you've had some rough ones. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm definitely the leader in the clubhouse in that area, you know, I had, <laughs> I, you know, I had the tennis fathers from outer space. So it's usually, <laughs> it's usually daddy's little girl. You don't find it as much with the boys. Um, I can just do a medley here. You know, Roddick's parents weren't involved. You know, Blanche and Jerry, they'd pick the balls up. They would say it's their thing. You carry your own water. You carry your own bag. But Andy was different because he had two older brothers that probably beat him up all the time. So he got some he got some good juice just from them. So the boy was a little different. But Sharapova's dad locked in. Capriotti's dad locked in. Pierce's dad locked in. Richard, okay, Richard locked in. Um, and they got to push, okay? You, they have to push because, um, but they got to have the art of psychology. And that's why Richard, not just because of what Venus and Serena came, became, because it's easy after the fact. Oh, I knew that was going to happen. He, he was like that then. He was like that as they started getting better. He was like that when they started winning tournaments. And he's like that today. He talks to them the same exact way and treats them that he's it's but he got it and we were cut from the same cloth that's why me and the williams family just clicked so you're, the question you asked is great is how i deal with the parents you gotta so you gotta have the ability to listen and you but you more importantly you got the ability to keep your mouth shut that's a big key because you know here i am you know writing curriculum for the uspta or <laughs> you win awards and then you got some guy then not richard i'm just saying people kind of telling me what to do and you're going, you, you want to make it like, okay, I'll do it like you want to do, but then I'll, I'll come back in and I'll, figure, I'll massage it. Or when they go off to eat, I'll come back in the back door. Because right. if you just sit there and take a stance, you know how that is. A couple bad losses, they're going to blame you. You're toast. You're out the door and bring in the next one. It's like that in NFL, NBA. It's like that with any coach. So dealing with the parents um, is uh, one, of my, one of my gifts because – these things are so volatile. The kids lose a couple of times. They got to blame someone. They're not going to blame, can't fire the parent. So to be able to keep my hands around that, and I think people probably, I hope they understand there's an art to that. Four years just with Richard and being able to keep, and the hitting partners and the cast, the characters and all the problems, as you know, come up every day and all the craziness. And there's media. We probably did a hundred interviews on TV and that, Venus was legendary and she never did anything. <laughs> it was like, she was like iconic. You never did anything yet. You don't think that made people a little angry. And then you throw in the African American card and I'm saying she's better in Capriati. So I'm protecting Richard. And I'm saying, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm out there in the middle of the road, you know, but it didn't matter because I knew what I could do and what I was building. And I just believed in the girls and whether it took four years, eight years or 10 years, it didn't matter. But dealing with the parents, any coach just has to take a deep breath because when you keep taking a stand and a stand, this is junior development. It's not junior final destination. And it's just always going to blow up. And if you're the other way, if you just try to be everybody's friend, yeah. you know, even though the girls, we, we, we had fun and I made things fun. You got to understand it was so intense. It was so competitive. I'm very demanding, but I do it in a different way. It's not going to be like Bobby Knight throwing a chair at you or something like that. I'll do it in a different way and I'll keep doing it until I get them to do it. And that's the art of coaching. Now, you know, what's funny is um, early on before I had kids, I don't think I fully understood what it meant to be a parent, let alone right. a tennis parent. And now that yeah. I've got three, I'm like, okay, now I get it 15 years ago when the parent was calling my phone at midnight to talk about that lesson. But one of the things I tell like parents now is, you know, once you find sort of a good coach, right? Who kind of knows what they're doing. Yeah. Uh, and I coach primarily girls, right? I always say every girl needs a soft place to land. 
So when you bring your kid to me, let me now be the bad guy so that after a loss, she can yeah. run into your arms, right? Or after That's a bad day in practice, she can run into your arms. But let me, because I know how to be the bad guy and balance it, where well, you got to take it home with you. Yeah. Right. And so you as a parent want to be that soft place. You don't want the coach to be that soft place all the time. So always uh, tell the dad, now that you got me, you need to be that soft place to land. Let me be the balance and be the bad guy. No, that's that's great advice because as they get older, they get their driver's license, they get a boyfriend or girlfriend. This thing changes very quickly <laughs> and they, the whole thing blows up. It can ruin vacations, families, you name it. And also your upbringing, you know. You know, Eastern Europeans that I've had, it's a different culture. You know, the Russians can do things a little different than the Americans. You know, a lot of parents are helicopter parents. They're right there. They're Velcro parents. There's entitlement. So, you know, you can't like, you can't yell at the kid, scream at the kid, tell them they're lazy and they're no good. And then go to the mall and buy them a Gucci bag. <laughs> you know what I mean? You, you, this, is, this is what happens. They, and this is what they don't understand. And this is what I love about Richard Williams. And it comes across in the movie. And that's why no matter, it, no matter what he did or what he said, and it looked like me and him argued, they kind of embellished that maybe a little bit. It wasn't like that because I, I loved the guy and I knew that he loved me and he knew what this was all about, you know? And so it's, 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 it's that because there's so much respect for him and, and how he handled the girls and there's not one, there's two. And that's a tricky slippery slope in itself. And you got all this media and it's like, it's like crazy. And then he started to say, as they got a little older, nothing against Venus, but this one's going to be better. I mean, mm -hmm. that alone could create you're at home and you're ready to put the gloves on, you know, <laughs> it's, it, but you got to understand it, it's he, the guy's amazing. And that yeah. respect, I mean, he learned a lot from me. But I also learned a lot from him about being a parent and everybody can take something out of his playbook, but uh, they shouldn't really coach your kids. They should live the heavy lifting to guys like you or whoever else is helping them. And uh, the parents should be their support and, uh, you know, just be such a positive influence because there's just you're going to lose. And that's how you're going to get better. And you can get stronger by, by losing. Venus never won any matches. She used to get throttled every day, every single day in practice. She never won a match. She'd go, Rick, I'll give you $5. Let's let me beat someone. Think about that. Mm -hmm. you, you lose matches anywhere at an academy for a month, you're gone. I mean, not Richard, we had a different arrangement, but right. that's the way it is nowadays, you know, and they just go to eight different places, go college, and they go to college. Right. <laughs> you know, exactly. They, they, right. They, like changing shoes, you know, next. Club to club to club. They get no better. Well, let me ask the, you this, the answer. The answer that's easy. Just go look in the mirror. Okay, next question. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I started an academy in Chicago, right? And, you know, you, you started an academy and that's your bread and butter, right? You have hundreds of kids there. They're shuffling in hour groups, privates, everything, fitness. Um, and then you get, you know, rare opportunities to work with a player like Capriati or Venus and Serena. And that takes you away from your academy, right? And it's hard to clone yourself. How did you balance that? Because not everybody, although it's cool to have Venus, Serena, Jennifer, Tommy Ho around, you're also taken away from the other kids who are like yeah. keeping the lights on. Yeah, You know, yeah. a lot of coaches struggle with that, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Including myself. How yeah. did you deal with that early on, having these opportunities you had to take advantage of, right? Yeah. You know, yeah. for the growth of the academy. Yeah, but yeah. then sort of maybe leaving some kids behind. First off, awesome question. And I, like I said, I've probably done, I bet 30, 35, either podcast or Instagram lives or whatever. And just recently, and it's like, no one's asked me that. And I think that's a very important question because I knew, let's talk about the Williams saying, I knew what the repercussions were because I not only was going to have to spend a lot more time with them to put Humpty Dumpty together, <laughs> that means also other people are going to get upset. And I had a lot of nation ranked kids, top 10 in the nation. They're actually better than them. Think about this. When I had Venus and Serena, I had Roddick, had his brother, had Tommy Ho, had Mary Pierce, Brenda McCarthy Schultz was there. Okay. I had a chance to go, you know, on the road with Sabatini. I mean, you got to understand, but I'm with these two little kids all the time. And they have hit, they have filet mignon. Everybody else is getting some nice burgers over here, but 
people want, you know, if you give them five cookies, they want to know where their fiber at. So it was tricky, but that's a decision that I made. The one good thing with my situation, you know, I have two arms and two legs and still my brain works good. And I teach a lot of privates. Okay. So it didn't hurt as much because I teach every day. So I'm still accessible. Now, I think it's worse if you try to have an academy and you go onto the road with one player, then it's going to blow up as you know, some people and that kind of happens. It gets very crazy. Uh, not that you're there working with them. They just want to see that you're there. Right. You know, I, you know, and so like, even right now, people are going to wonder where's Rick, you know, I'm, I'm actually doing a little bit more of these. So right now, so I'm always there. So that being said, um, it's a balancing act. And from a business point of view, not only are you, I was doing that for sweat equity for maybe the future, and that could have been a catastrophic injury and nothing would have happened. You know, I'm not teaching someone three, four, five, six, eight hundred dollars an hour a private lesson. So it's a double whammy. Okay. <laughs> and there's jealousy. So more people didn't come than came. See, my situation is very different than other academies. Uh, my model is different. I don't want to say anything's bulletproof, but because, you know, I probably teach like close to 3,000 hours a year of privates, I drive the engine in this business. And then there's eight to 10 other coaches and, you know, like everybody else, matches and the fitness. So it's, a, and we don't have a glorified boarding school. So the risk and reward isn't there like other places that try to do like all one stop shopping. The model doesn't work financially. You're going down a very tricky path because these things don't work. It's too volatile. People come and go. You got to give deals. You know, people expect this and that. So I've been able to maintain it and have all these high ranked players or pros that come in. I work with everybody with edge. I mean, there's like 13 girls on the tour, you know, that are 18 to 22 years old. And I evaluate all these players and work with them when they're here besides the regular kids that are here. So it is tricky. And I think at the end of the day, you got to, you can't get caught up in like the glamour and the glitz and all that type of stuff. Because even now that everything, a lot of things are, have changed around me. People want me to do like a little more of this and that. I'm going to keep doing exactly what I'm doing. You know, I'm going to be on court one, doing my thing and things look good on the outside, get a chance to do a few things. I will, but it takes away from what I really want to do. And that's being with even the, the seven-year-old girl that just wants to learn great strokes at Rick Macy Tennis Academy. Yeah, so you, so you never really spent that much time on the road to be absent from the academy. No, right. and I wouldn't. And listen, I've had, I don't want to get into people, I've had opportunity like you have no idea in the past. Okay, I went to a few things early on with Tommy when he was younger. You know, I went to Memphis, US. So I used to go with Tommy a little bit but that was like back in the early nineties, but I just never wanted to do that. And here we are. And like I said, it, it have a great business, a great model, you know, uh, we're not for everybody, you know, um, it's more kids may 16 and under, uh, and then pros that want to come in. So it's not a glorified boarding school. It's a very different model, but to answer your question, I think when you go on the road, you're asking for trouble because now you're just saying, I want to be with them. And you made a good point. I can show her by the methodology and I've had four or five guys, people here that have been with me like six, seven, eight years, which is unheard of. And they can sing the song, but they want you or they want me. And, you know, that I know that even now, you know, I, I talk to almost everybody who comes. I almost return every email. Your guy called me to do this and I got back to him in 24 hours and here we are doing it the next day. You know, so I try to be involved, not just the tennis part, but just try to give that customer service and then hopefully deliver a world-class product on the tennis court. Yeah. So that's that, my question was, um, you know, how, how hard have you found it to duplicate yourself? Right. Because, you know, we've got academies like mine, you've got 16, 17 coaches. I think, you know, in our business, because it's such an individual sport and you're raised that way, yeah. everyone's dream is to have their name on the flag. Right. And so everyone comes to Rick Macy tennis Academy because and your yours is like really your name. Mine isn't my yeah. name, right? Yeah. And then, but they can't have you. So how how hard have you had it? You know, have you seen it to be the to train people and to get them to say, you may have been taught one way, but here's how we teach it at Macy. 
Uh, first off, another great question. You know, it's, believe it or not, it's not that hard. And the reason why, obviously the track record is kind of locked in, you know, who I've helped or who I've coached or, you know, people won grand slams or just everything that's happened in the past. And then everything biomechanically, this methodology I put together about 12 years ago with Brian Gordon. So a lot of things are backed up by science. And you've seen some of this stuff on YouTube on the forehand. I mean, not like 6 million people. It kind of revolutionized how people maybe teach the ATP forehand. So a lot of stuff is cutting edge, but it's not just that. It's the fact that you're so accessible. And even now, so even after the movie, I pick up the phone, they go, that ain't you. I go, this is me. They go, that's not you. Then I go, bang. And they go, oh, it is you. Okay, I give out a bang. So, so I, I think it's, we're all people. You know, we all have our strengths and weaknesses and stuff like that, but it is hard to uh, duplicate, but I have a great staff and not just on the court, but out off the court. And it's all about, you know, a family and trying to be personalized. And the minute you walk in the, the parks, like Disneyland and Candyland, if you're ever in Florida, you should come. It's like motivational signs everywhere. And it's just high energy and it's not stuffy. And it's just uh, a great place to train and try to get to the most of your ability, but it's hard to duplicate. People have asked me, many times let's put a place here in greece let's do something in dubai let's do something in california and i said listen we can do that it never works after a year sure i might get some upfront money it's not going to work more people will not like me or the brand okay i might pick up more cheddar for the bank account in the moment and they just never work that never works you see what nick's done that and it just never works it's a money grab so I've never been wired that way. Um, and uh, if I did do something like that, okay, I would have to go there quite a bit. You know, I don't feel like getting on a plane and going to India three times a year or to China. <laughs> I mean, I'm not, that's not me. You know, I just don't, it wouldn't, it wouldn't work. So, and another thing, because like when you got back to, you asked me earlier about, you know, if say you win Wimbledon, I'm just talking or us open you're a top 10 in the world and you try to do what you and i do or people that do this they have no idea how difficult this is because first off they're not going to probably want to take any crap from a parent okay of a 12 year old that you know spoiled little kid they're because they're used to they're used to winning millions of dollars or they want a grand slam or they're top 10 in the world they're, they they think just the name because they they were this if people are going to come and just start giving them money, it never works. Now, maybe in New York, it works a little better because there's so much people with money and it can kind of happen a little bit at McEnroe, but then the quality of the production, who knows what that is. So what I'm trying to say is it's, it's very tricky. You got to, you and me or anybody, you got to be there every, you got to be there all the time. You got to work it. It's all about the little thing. You, you can never get satisfied and you got to just keep your eye on the ball because it's just too volatile. And if you've been on the tour and you just want to have Academy and you want your name on it, that's fine. But if you want to make money and you want to have it to be a business, that becomes a whole different animal. That's a whole different thing. Uh, unless you just have a lot of money, it doesn't matter. Like some people <laughs> have an Academy, you know, you have wealthy parents or you maybe get all these crazy sponsors. So um, that's kind of my sermon for any coach that listened to this. It's, a, it's very tricky, but you work hard every day outwork the competition, do the best that you can, and that's all you can control. So let me ask you this. Um, Sloan won the U.S. Open September 9th of 2017. And my daughter did not hit a tennis ball until September 6th of 2018. Now, slept in the same room as Sloan, slept in the next room at Taylortown. I mean, just, you know, so much talent there. And at that moment, my daughter for one year did not touch a tennis ball, right? I don't know if it's perhaps she didn't, you know, feel like she could measure up. Now that that kind of thing happened or whatever it is, but that was sort of like a, a tough year for me. I never pushed anyone. Like I actually don't even teach my kid. I let the other guys teach my kid. Um, but you've got three daughters. Do they play? And how hard was it? Uh, no, it wasn't hard whatsoever. They're all very athletic. Uh, they're older now, like 25, 23, 22. So they're older, but they're very athletic. Okay. And early on, uh, it, crazy. I have three daughters, you know, no boy had three daughters. Okay. It's kind of interesting, but 
one day they came to the academy. I took them there. It's like 110 degrees, middle of July, and the kids are all running. And they were running with Sophia Kennan. Sophia was that age at that time. And they were all running around the courts. And all three of my daughters, when they went to the gate, instead of keep running, they went right out the gate to the water fountain. And I go, <laughs> okay, we're going out for gymnastics, okay? That right. showed me inside that they didn't want to sweat and really do this. And listen, I know this more than anybody. I ain't going to take my kids to tournament unless I think they can get the W. Okay. Right. I ain't, I ain't going to go there. I ain't going to go there and get pumped on, you know, you know, yeah. I, I, I like cream Macy, you know, it's like, right, right. <laughs> you know, wait a minute. You, you beat Sampras's niece of a niece. You didn't beat Pete Sampras. Right, right, you, right. Beat, you beat McEnroe's McEnroe of a niece of an uncle. You didn't beat John. Right, so right. It, I didn't, I, I just, and so they all did gymnastics. They were like amazing. My two daughters never lost. And then as they got older, they just bagged that. But no, listen, I'm very black and white. You're the in or out. If you're in, here's the way it's going to happen. If you're out, no problem. So that's it. There's other things in life. So uh, I wasn't going to have one foot in. You're either in or out. And when they went through the gate, uh, they, they came once in a while and hit the ball around, but it was all just messing around. But when I saw that, that showed me that uh, not that they couldn't change because your brain reasons later as you get older, like right. Serena, you know, um, I just knew. And they, they like that air conditioning. They right. still like it. They still like it better today. You know, <laughs> here, I, here I am. I'm like, I'm like part lizard. You know, I've been on the court since 22. And when it's 100 degrees, I love it out there. And when it's like 60, I'm cold. So right. uh, uh, that's what makes the world go round. So, man, you've been very generous with your time. It's always good, you know, talking to you and I probably you know, been similar places and it's, it's always it's the real world. It's the real world. It's the real, real world, world. Right. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, so now I got one, one, one more question is if you had to build your all-star best player ever of the people you've taught, whose forehand would you put take whose backhand would you take who serve volleys footwork? Obviously we can think of two people you take, yeah. put, put together your perfect player for a male or female. Ah, female. Okay. I'm a girl's coach. Yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, definitely Federer's forehand. Definitely Djokovic's backhand. Roddick serve because the way it's synchronized from the ground up, forget the cosmetic, the take back and how he did all. It's no, once he gets in the power position, he's optimal. I mean, he's like straight up. So it would be Roddick serve once he gets that position. Federer's right. forehand, Djokovic's backhand. Uh, the inner quality of Serena and to this day, Meek, I call her Meek. Uh, she, she probably thinks she's undefeated in her own way. She never probably thinks she's even lost. She just yeah. ran out of time. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a way you play this game within a game of your own mind. Okay. Um, and then uh, obviously the movement of Venus, no one can go from A to B, but, but with like Venus, but the legs helped it. But inside the legs, she had these strides and her makeup speed was brutal. No one's ever been able to hit on the run like Venus Williams. And I think if people don't agree with that, they're not, they're looking at the wrong movie. She could hit on the run. Like, cause the, you know, she has a, like Joker, he can stretch out or Medvedev. They have these tentacles that just keep right on going and then they get behind the ball. So um, that would be my ultimate player. Um, but a lot of guys are in the neighborhood on the forehand, but I like better cause it's a little shorter. And I like his grip because he can hit a tighter spin. Um, and I, his Djokovic's backhand is optimal. You know, it's at 630. I use the clock analogy. He pulls with the right, pushes with the left, the racket flips. And he does, his spine's always straight. So to look at people, you want to pick up from that. But there's so many good players. But if I would have to say, answer the question the way you asked, uh, those would be the leader in the clubhouse. Well, man, I, I appreciate you. Um... <laughs> You know, obviously, you, you've been a gift to the game. Uh, I'm, I'm actually, whenever there's a movie about tennis, it's always good. Even if it was a bad movie, which it wasn't. But even if it was a bad movie, it's always good because we are op we're operating in a very small sport that a lot of people have tried to make bigger. Yourself, Nick, myself. And yeah. I hope, you know, one day my dream, like I'm a dreamer, right? One day my dream is that at some point we all get together in a room like a football uh you know, football staff, where you got offensive coordinator, defensive coordinator, special teams, head coach, and get a chance to really help American tennis get to be where it needs to be through collaboration. 
No, that, versus that, 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 that'd that be awesome. I think it's long overdue. But I got a question for you. When you saw the movie, because you didn't know what to expect, were you surprised by anything? So I flipped this around. Uh, I was not surprised by anything, probably because, you know, when I first got on tour, I was the only black coach on tour. Right. Okay. No Coco Golf's dad. Yeah. Zach wasn't with Francis. I was it was only me. And so Richard would always yeah. pull me in a corner. <laughs> always in the right? corner. And talk to me and spit on me yeah. and pass gas. Right. <laughs> and sort of like, you know, sort of like tell me all these stories. Um, so I, nothing was a surprise, but I was what, what what shocked me was how well it was put together. Right. And and Will Smith. Oh, yeah has immortalized three black men, Muhammad Ali, yeah. right? Uh, Chris Gardner, who I went to high school with his son in pursuit of happiness, uh -huh. and now Richard Williams. And so how well it was put together surprised me. Um, but, you know, it, I think it was, I mean, literally when the fart, I was like, that's Richard. I, 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 I can recall three or four lunches. I'm like, bro, I'm eating. Like, can you, I'm, I'm eating and you just did that. That's Richard. He's a, his own person. That's it. <laughs> so yeah, so it was it was great, man. I was and I was honestly happy that you got your flowers, right? You know, we talk about appreciating people. That I was happy that you got your flowers and your contribution to the game, and you know, even your contribution is. I think you just said a lot of things that people can learn from. Absolutely. I enjoyed the exchange and look yeah. forward to more. All right, we'll do it again. Thank you, Rick. This uh, is the right, com podcast. I'm your host, Kamal Murray, and we've had the honor and the privilege of being the legendary Rick Macy. We'll see you again. All right. Take care. Thank you, brother. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.